From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. We're still in our Palo Alto studios. We're still getting through COVID and we're still doing all of our remotes, uh, all of our interviews via remote. And I'm really excited to have a guest. We had her on a long time ago. I looked it up, it was 2016, April, 2016. She's Coco Brown, the founder and CEO of the Athena Alliance. Coco, it's uh, great to see you. It's great to see you as well. We actually formally started in April of 2016. I know, I saw, I noticed that on LinkedIn. So we were at the Girls in Tech Catalyst Conference in Phoenix. Uh, I remember it was a really cool conference, met a ton of people, a lot of them have turned out to, that are on your board. So yeah, and you formally on LinkedIn, it says you started in May. So that was right at the yep. very, very beginning. Yeah, that's right. That's so right. for people that aren't familiar with the Athena Alliance, give them the, uh, the quick overview. Okay. Well, it's a little different than it was four years ago. So um, Athena, first and foremost, is, uh, is a digital platform. So you literally log in to Athena and we're a combination of community access to opportunity and learning. Um, and so, you, you know, you can kind of envision it a little bit like a walled garden around a LinkedIn meets Khan Academy for senior executives meets, you know, Hollywood agency for women trying to get into the boardroom and senior level roles uh, in the C-suite as advisors, et cetera. And then um, the way that we operate is you can have a self-service experience of Athena. You can have a concierge experience of Athena with real humans in the loop making key connections for you. And you can add accelerators where we build brand packages and bios and uh, give you executive coaching. So wow. kind of a- You've built out your, uh, your services portfolio over the last several years. But still yeah, the focus is have. boards, right? Still the focus is getting women on public boards or is that no longer still the focus? No, no, that's, that's a big piece of it for sure. I mean, one of the things that we discovered that was the very first um, mission of Athena was to bring more women into the boardroom. And as we were doing that, we discovered that once you get into a senior realm of leadership in general, there's more things that you want to do than just get into the boardroom. Um, some of it may be wanting to be an investor, an LP in a fund, or become a CEO, um, or certainly join outside boards, but also be relevant to your own inside board. And so we started to look at Athena as a, a more holistic experience for senior leaders who are attempting to make sure that they are the best they can be in this very senior realm of overarching stewardship of business. Awesome. And have you seen... So obviously your, your focus shifted because you needed to add more, more services based on the demand uh, from the customers, but have you seen the receptiveness um, to women board members change over the last four years? How have you seen kind of the, the marketplace change? Yeah, it's changed a lot, I would say. Um, first of all, I think laws like the California law, um, Goldman Sachs coming out saying they won't take companies public unless they have a diverse board. You know, the, the, the statements by big entities that people are paying attention to made the boardroom dynamics a conversation around the dinner table in general. So it became more of a common conversation and, and common interest as opposed to just the interest of a few people who are trying to get in there. Um, and so that that's created a lot of momentum as well as um, sort of thoughtfulness from leaders and from employees and from larger stakeholders to say, uh, you know, the diversity at the top of business has to mimic the demographics of society as a whole. And that's become a little bit more accepted as opposed to um, grudgingly sort of uh, taken in. Right, right. So one of the big problems always, it's like the VC problem, right? Is the whole matchmaking problem. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, how do you, you know, how, how do qualified people find qualified opportunities. And I wonder if you can speak a little bit as to how that process has evolved. How are you really helping? Because there's always people that are looking for quality candidates and there's great quality candidates out there that just don't know where to go. How are you helping bridge, you know, kind of that kind of basic matchmaking uh, function? Yeah, and there's a couple of different ways to go about it. Um, one is certainly to understand and have real connections into the parts of the leadership ecosystem that influences or makes the decision as to who sits around that table. So that would be 
communities of CEOs, it's communities of existing board directors, it's venture capital firms, it's private equity firms. And as you get really entrenched in those organizations and those ecosystems, you become part of that ecosystem and you become what they turn to to say, hey, do you know somebody? Because it still is a who do you know um, approach at this at, at the senior most levels. So that's one way. The other um, the other mechanism is really for individuals who are looking for board seats who want to be on boards to actually be thinking about how they proactively navigate their way to the kinds of boards that they would fit to. Um, I liken it very much to the way our children go after the schools that they might want to when it's time for a university. You know, figure out who your safeties, your matches, your reaches are, and figure out how you're going to take six degrees of separation and make it and turn them into one through connections. Right. Um, so those are that's another way to go about it. You know, it's interesting. I talked to Beth Stewart from TrueStar. They also help place yeah. place uh, women on boards, and and one of the issues is just the turnover. Um, and, and I asked Beth just straight up, you know, you know, are there formal mechanisms to make sure that people who've been doing business uh, from way before there were things like email and the internet, um, you know, eventually get swapped out? And she said, you know, that's actually a, a big part of the problem is there isn't really a formal way to keep things fresh and to kind of rotate the incumbents out to enable somebody who's new and maybe has a different point of view to come in. So I'm curious when, when you know, someone is targeting their A-list and B-list and C-list, how do they factor in, you know, kind of the age of the board, composition of the existing board to really look for where there's these opportunities where a spot opens up, you know, because if there's not a spot open up, clearly there's really not much opportunity there. Yeah, I mean, you have to, you have to look at the whole ecosystem, right? I mean, there's, anything from let's say series a um venture backed private companies all the way up to the mega cap companies right and there's this this continuum and um it's not it's there's not one universal uh answer to what you're talking about so for example if you're talking about smaller private companies you're competing against not somebody giving up their seat but whether or not the company feels real motivation to fill that uh, particular uh, independent director seat. So the biggest competition is often that that seat goes unfilled. Um, you know, and you're talking about public companies, the biggest competition is really the fact that as my friend Adam Epstein of the Small Cap Institute will tell you um, that 80% of public companies are actually small cap companies. And, you know, they don't have the same kinds of pressures that uh, large caps do to have turnover. Um, but yeah, it, it takes a, a big piece of the challenge is really boards having the disposition collectively to see the board as a competitive advantage for the business, as a very necessary and productive piece of the business. And, and when they see that, then they take more proactive measures to make sure they have a evolving and strong board that does turn over as it needs to. Right, right. So I'm curious when you're talking to to high power women, right, who are in, in operational roles probably most of the time, um, how do you help coach them? How should they be thinking? What, what do they have to do different when they want to, you know, kind of add board seats to their to their portfolio? Very different kind of a role than an operational role. Very different kind of concerns and day to day tasks. So. And clearly you've added a whole bunch of, of extra things to your portfolio. So how do you help people? How, what do you tell women who say, okay, I've, I've been successful, I'm a successful executive, but now I want to do this other thing. I want to take this next step into my career. What's usually the gaps and what are the things that they need to do to uh, prepare for that? Well, I, you know, I'm going to circle and then land a little bit. Um, Autodesk was actually a really great partner to us back when you and I first met they uh, had a couple of women at the top of the organization that were part of Athena specifically because they wanted to join boards. They, they are on boards now, Lisa Campbell, um, Amy Bunzel, um, uh, Debbie Clifford. And what they told us as they were experiencing everything that we were offering in terms of developing them, helping them to position themselves, understand themselves, navigate their way, was that they simply became better leaders as a result of focusing on themselves as that next level up, um, irrespective of the fact that it took them two to three years to get to land that seat, they became stronger in their executive role in general and better 
uh, able to communicate and engage with their own boards. So I think, you know, now I'm landing. The, the thing that I would say about that is don't wait until you're thinking, oh, I want to join a board to do the work to get yourself into that ecosystem, into that atmosphere and into that mindset, because the, the sooner you do that as an executive, the better you will be in that atmosphere, the more prepared you will be. And you also have to recognize that it will take time. Right, right. And then how has COVID impacted it? I mean, on one hand, um, you know, meeting somebody for coffee and having a face-to-face -face is, is a really important part of of getting to know someone and and a, and a big part of, I'm sure, what was the recruitment process and do you know someone? Yeah, let's go meet for a cup of coffee or dinner or whatever. Can't do that anymore, um, but we can all meet this way. We can all get on virtually. And so in, in some ways, you know, this, it's probably an enabler, which before, you know, you could grab an hour and you didn't have to fly cross country or somebody didn't have to fly cross country. So I'm kind of curious in this new reality, which is going to continue for some time, um, how has that impacted, you know, kind of people's ability to discover and get to know and build trust uh, for these very, very senior positions? HBR just came out with a really great article about the virtual board meeting. I don't know if you saw it, but I can send you a link. Um, I think that what I'm learning from board directors uh, in general and leaders in general is that yes, there's things that make it difficult to engage remotely, but there's also a lot of benefit to being able to get comfortable with the virtual world. So it's um, certainly, particularly with COVID, with um, racial equity issues, with the uh, uncertain economy, boards are having to meet more often. Um, and they're having, you know, some are having weekly standups and those are facilitated by getting more and more comfortable with being virtual. Uh, and I think they're, you know, they're realizing that you don't have to press flesh, as they say, to actually build intimacy and real connection. And that's a, that's been a holdout. But I think as the top leadership gets to understand that and feel that for themselves, it becomes easier for them to adopt it throughout the organization that, you know, the virtual world is, is one we can really embrace, not right. just for a period of time. It's funny, we had, we had John Chambers on early on uh, in this whole process, really talking about leadership and leading through transitions. And he used the example, I think it had been that day or, or maybe a, a couple of days off from our interview where they had a board meeting. I think they were talking about um, some hamburger restaurant. And so they just delivered hamburgers to everybody's, to everybody's office and they had the board meeting. But that's really progressive for a board to actually be doing um, weekly standups <laughs> that really yeah. shows a pretty transformative way to manage the business than, you know, kind of what we think is the stodgy old, you know, traditional get together now and then fly in, look at some minutes and, and fly out. That's super progressive. Yeah. I mean, I was on three different board meetings this week with a company I'm on the board of in Minnesota. We haven't seen each other in person and I guess since January. <laughs> So final final tips for for women that want to make this this move who you know they've got some they got some uh, breathing space they're not homeschooling the kids all day while they're trying to get their job done and trying to save their own business but have you know some cycles and the capabilities what do you tell them where should they begin how should they start thinking about you know kind of taking on this additional responsibility and and really professional growth in their life Well I mean I think I think something very important for all of us to think about with regard to board service and in general, as we get into a very senior level point in our careers and kind of managing an impact portfolio, you know, people get into a senior point and they don't just want to be an executive for one company. They, they want to have a variety of ways that they're, they're um, delivering impact, whether it's as an investor or as a board member, or as you know, other, other things, as well as being an operator. And I think the misnomer is that people believe that you have to add them up and they, you know, one plus one plus one equals three. And it's just not true. The, the truth is, is that when you add a board seat, when you add that other thing that you're doing, um, it makes you better as a leader in general. And every board meeting I have with Archer Point gives me more that I bring back to Athena as an example. And so I think we tend to think of not being able to take on one more thing. And um, I say that we all have a little more space than we think we have to take on the things we want to do. Right. 
That's a good message. I mean, it, it, it is often said, if you want to get something done, give it to the busiest person in the room. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's more likely to get it done because you got to be efficient and that's you just have that, uh, you know, kind of get it done attitude. That's right. All right, Coco. Well, thank you uh, for thank you for sharing your thoughts. Congratulations. So I guess it's your four four year anniversary, five year anniversary. Yeah, it's right? four, four. That's uh, that's terrific. Yeah. And um, we look forward to uh, continuing to watch the growth and hopefully checking in face to face at some point in the not too distant future. <laughs> I would like that. All right. Thanks a lot, Coco. Great talking to you. All righty. She's Coco. I'm Jeff. You're watching the Cube. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.